heart and genuine honesty don't exist. And people have proven that to be correct all too often. I decided I wanted, I announced the first of the week that I wanted to spend some time with Jesus from the book of John. And as you look at the bulletin, that article reflects beginning a study of the Gospel of John. The bulletin was printed Thursday, and it dawned on me Thursday night, and I woke up Friday morning. I says, I need to spend a little bit of time with Peter in Second Peter because it's too close to the time we spent in First Peter for those who've been here in recent weeks. So I want us to look at some of the main messages of Peter for a little bit before perhaps looking at some of the messages from the Gospel of John. I think God showed himself to me for the first time when he was dealing with Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. God had the clear intention of destroying Sodom and Gomorrah because of their evil, wicked sin. And he made that desire known. His intent was clear. And Abraham comes to him and begins bartering with him, if you will. And what has always amazed me is that Abraham came before God and did something that most of us would not have done. And I'm not sure we are quick to want to do it even today. But he began to say, if 50 or 45 can be found, or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10, will you save the city? This bargaining with God to save people but it dawned on me Friday morning when reading verses 9 and 10 from 2 Peter 3 that this is the nature of the God that I serve. And it's the God who works with us day by day to bring us more and more to look and act more like Jesus Christ. This is his desire for us. This is what he does toward us why has he not given up on us some of you were raised in circumstances to where you may have felt like people did give up on you I'm fortunate to say that that was not my lot I knew a loving set of grandparents and parents and others who did and would have done anything for me. They did not overlook my mistakes, but they saw something in me, and others have seen it in you, that would encourage them to never, ever, ever give up on you. And we are blessed today having that in our experience. I want to spend much of the lesson reading verses that describe this nature of God. I don't want us to ever get tired of hearing them. Exodus 34, verse 6. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, and faithfulness. He reminds us that God is a God of holiness, but it's his nature to not be taken for granted, but it's also his nature to clearly reveal himself to us, to be absolutely certain we know what he is about, and then to act toward us in this way giving us every, every opportunity. We may go back in coming weeks in the short time that I want to spend time in 2 Peter and be reminded of 2 Peter 3, verse 8, 
I didn't read that as the core verse as we began. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And he did that to begin talking of the nature of God. Having talked in earlier verses, and we will go visit those about that day of the Lord, that second coming when people will be held accountable for their actions, for their will for sins, and their willingness not to take advantage of what God made available for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And there were some who would suggest in these times, well, I'm not afraid of what's ahead because all of this time has gone by. I have plenty of time, and I'll do it one day. And they use verse 8 as their excuse. A day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. I have plenty of time. We serve a patient God. Numbers 14, verse 18, it reminds us of the rebellious nature of Israel. It shows us the sad result on this occasion from God. We're told that Yahweh is slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. And if you look at all of what Scripture tells us in the Old Testament, He's not telling us that I'm suffering for the sins of my father. He's telling us that the sins of the father have a consequence to next generations. Sons tend to follow the example of fathers. And it tends to be passed down, true of daughters and mothers as well. Our influence matters, and it will be followed by other people, and it's just the reality of what human nature would teach us. And God will not hold any sin without some responsibility attached to it. I like the reading of of Nehemiah chapter 9. In that book of leadership, we see a time when they had rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem in a fairly short period of time. It had been allowed to crumble over many years. Nehemiah was afar off, and he wept over the reality of that wall not being rebuilt. It represented the attitude they held toward God. And when they had rebuilt that wall... Nehemiah 9 verse 17 they refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them they became stiff necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery but you're a forgiving God gracious and compassionate slow to anger abounding in love therefore you did not desert them And we know when they rebuilt that wall, they stood up and they listened for hours one day to the law being read. And they responded very reverently to the law and to God. And for at least another period of their life, they were faithful to this God who gave them laws under which to live. Psalm 86 verse 15 But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. I would wonder, do we ever get tired of hearing that? Do we need to hear it more often as we're striving to be pleasing to God day by day? Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. 
He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our trespasses from us, and as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are but dust. God knows us inside and out. He knows when we're making an effort. He knows when we're not. He knows when we're truly repentant and he knows when we're not and that's not something we can ever say and we should never to presume that we know that but God does and he's willing to take us back as often as we will come back to him I've had discussions in recent weeks and over a period of years and I preached a lesson the first month I was here, I think, about legalism and gratitude, of whether we're earning our grace or whether we're just grateful for what God has done for us. And the reality is he's trying to say over and over, who am I? What do you know about me? How should you respond to me in light of your sin? And for some reason, we buy into whatever it might be and hold back and don't respond as we should. I appreciate, and we studied Romans, parts of it at least, several weeks and months ago. I appreciate the reality of Romans 2, verse 4. Paul was talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the religionist, the scholars would say. Those who claim religion and those who would pass judgment on others assuming no judgment would be passed upon them. And very quickly in verse 14, he talks about those who were not even under the Old Testament law and their conscience became their law. We all stand responsible before God and he made that point in that second chapter but he revealed human nature in Romans 2 verse 4 and when I first saw this a number of years ago thankful to a very very good teacher it struck me between the eyes of how so much like some of us we are described here. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? I'm going to repeat the opening verses, uh, words, as he adds to the list. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his tolerance? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his patience? Are we guilty of that? not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. As we would seek to explain the verse, we could say, but rather should it not lead us to repentance? God's patience, his kindness, his tolerance. Think in your mind to the most kind, patient, loving person you've ever known. Think of that loving, kind, patient person and see if you can admit that maybe you took advantage of that from time to time. You may have gone a little bit further in your words or actions because you could take advantage of the nature of that person, patience, kindness, tolerance. As we deal with God and as we have dealt with others in the past, it should cause us to be even more given to this repentance. 
instead of playing a game, instead of taking advantage, their nature should have had an effect upon us to where it would have encouraged us and moved us quicker, sooner to the repentance that needed to be there. I think in Romans 2, Paul was telling the Pharisees, you're taking advantage of these attributes of God that were so often revealed through his actions to the children of Israel. You need to repent. It's our greatest need, forgiveness. We need to repent. And God's love and kindness and patience and all of those things should be there. This wise teacher, and I go back to 1980, made a point that stuck with me ever since. I think I knew it. I know these verses said it, but it never hit me between the eyes until he said it using these verses. Why doesn't Christ come back? Peter's answering that question. Why hasn't Christ come back? Hasn't he revealed himself fully enough? Hasn't he established a spiritual kingdom? And it's been in existence for hundreds and hundreds of years. His message is transferred now into 3,000 plus translations of scripture, of language. Isn't it time for Christ to come back? And when we would suggest that, it reminds us what these verses remind us of. He hasn't come back because we have friends and family who've not yet repented of sin. And if he came back today, they would be lost eternally. And as soon as we remember that, we don't want him to come back, do we? We want them to have more time. As we gather around communion each Sunday, we declare his death until he comes again. The Passover feast, they were told to pull up your long garments and be ready to move easily your mobility can be affected. Don't let it be affected. Pull up your garments and be ready to go when it's time to go. And metaphorically, that's what we declare when we commune around this table. We're ready to go. We declare his death until he comes again. And then we start remembering family, other relatives, maybe even distant, that we don't think about that often. And we think about neighbors and work associates. And I don't want the responsibility of deciding when Christ comes. I don't think you do either. I want them to have all the time God is willing to give them. And yet Peter, very quickly, and we'll go there a little bit more in the next week or two, but he said in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. There will be a time of reckoning. The Lord's patience will eventually not wear thin. It's just the time that he has chosen. And Christ doesn't even know when that time will be. I pray daily as you do for family members who are yet not members of the body of Christ or family members who are unfaithful, wanting them to come to their senses wanting God to give them more time. And whatever needs to happen, I'll leave that to the circumstances that he would put into play. 
that might bring them back. Close family member on hospice care right now, and we're prayerful that it will bring some of the family back. It will wake them up. Every indication is that it's waking him up. I mentioned this Wednesday week ago. Wake him up. He has time. A few days left. Make things right. We talked last week as we finished 1 Peter that he seemed to be in a situation like we are from time to time to walk out to the car ready to say goodbye after several days of visit and wanting to be sure we say the most important things. He does the same thing in this second letter. He gets down after much discussion and much needed counsel and much directive about developing Christian character, probably the lesson next week. It gets down to the most important thing. And I felt like I needed to do that today. God is patient. Do what you need to do. Get things right with God. I heard several years ago that some objected to the song and refused to sing it, just a little talk with Jesus. And I understood what they were suggesting. If we think it's just a little talk with Jesus, I'm in willful sin, it's just a little talk with Jesus to make things right. And if we're trivializing it, if we're planning our sin, if we're planning our timing to where we can do all we want to do and then... I don't look at it that way. I chose not to teach that as a negative of that song. I've chosen to simply say God is faithful and he's just. And if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus came to save. Jesus and the second coming is not happening yet. And we don't know when it will happen. Why would we want to live in uncertainty if we're striving to be more like Jesus? Why would we want to be uncertain of our eternal fate when we don't have to? When the way is provided for us the nature of the one who will judge. And by the way, he's going to judge our actions. We decide. He's going to abide by our decision. Why would we wait to be right with God? But he will be patient. But at some point, his son will come back. That's a message we need to act upon. And we don't need to treat his tolerance, his love, his patience, and his kindness as if we can play game with repentance, taking advantage of that nature, as Romans 2 verse 4 would teach. This morning, as we stand and sing a song of encouragement, Peter would tell us as he has through scripture and we'll see others in the next couple, two or three weeks trying to encourage us to wake up, to be ready and to see the kind of person that we can become with God's help and the example of Christ and the direction that's given to us by writers of the New Testament. This morning, make again a most important decision and be right with God while we stand and sing. Only in thee, O Savior mine, dwell in my soul in peace divine. Peace of the world, though all combine, 
never can take from thee. Pleasures of earth so seemingly sweet fail on the last my longings to meet. Only in thee my bliss is complete. Only, dear Lord, in thee, only in thee a radiance bright shines like a beacon in the night, guiding my pilgrim.